Good morning from my part of the world to all of you, or good afternoon, wherever you're based in the US. Um, I really just want to begin with some gratitude and thank Phil and Michael and Hillel International for making this conversation possible. And to thank all of you for um, giving up your time to be here and to be in this webinar, to be in community, to be in conversation together. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, I'll, you know, I don't know if you, should I introduce myself? I don't know if you know who I am or anything, but um, I'm based in Sydney, Australia. And my background is in psychotherapy, facilitation and leadership development. And I should um, dispel the myth that I don't have a true accurate Australian accent because I grew up in South Africa and I lived in Israel for a bit and my partner is American. So I have quite a blend of, of accents. Don't be fooled by my, by my accent. Um, I also want to say by way of introduction that if you can see the reaction button at the bottom, at the, on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, we can also use the reaction button as a way of engaging with each other during, the, during this conversation. So if you hear something that resonates with you, maybe it's something that I've said, hopefully something will resonate, or if it's something you hear from each other, you may want to give a thumbs up or clap hands or whatever it is, just to um, send some communication between each other to track what we're, what we're, where we're going. So I'm going to um, share my screen with you so you can see the slide deck and we will take it from there. And please feel free to jump in at any time with questions, whether that's in the chat box or even if you want to jump in verbally. As much as there is content here for us to get through, it's for me at least much more important that we attend to your questions. Um, there'll be more guiding as to where we need to go today. So feel free to jump in. But I do want to, this is just a bit of a roadmap of where we're going today, but I'm not gonna waste time explaining each part. We'll just get to those parts when we get to them. But I do want to begin here by saying that, just by trying to set the scene a little bit, which obviously won't be you know, breaking news to anyone here. But I do wanna say that we, as you know, are living in really a once in a lifetime moment as it's being called. And uh, we're living in a crisis which was declared by the World Health Organization as a global pandemic in March of this year. And as we know, there's no current vaccine to this crisis, to this virus. There is a huge race around the world right now to try and create and establish a, a vaccine for the virus. Um, and all the while, our healthcare systems across the globe are really being pushed to the edges of their capacity while a lot of our global economies are in chaos. Um, and we know from our own lived experience, which is enough of an experience that quarantine and lockdown and isolation bears huge impacts on all of our lives across all areas of our lives. And as of about 40 minutes ago, I checked the statistics and you can see here, these are the number of cases and the number of deaths that we've seen across the globe as well as a result of this crisis. So to say that we're living you know, under and within acute stress in our system is, is an understatement of note because none of us have been here before and we're all really trying to make our way through the crisis, through the mess, through the loss of it all each day. And while we're doing that, um, I also believe that we're clasping on as best we can for hope and for resolution to this crisis around the world. So this is all happening and at the same time, the threat of death is really looming quite greatly on all of us too. Many of us may have lost loved ones or know people who are ill or may have been at risk ourselves. So I wanna be sensitive towards that as well. And to say that this virus really attacks um, the most vulnerable in our community. And um, this adds to the uncertainty, it adds to the stress of this moment. So the first thing I want to invite you to do is to, um, you know, given the context that we're meeting in, that we're living in at the moment that we're operating in, my question to you is how are you feeling in this moment? And I wanna invite you to share your response in the chat box, whether it's just a one word or a few words or even a sentence. I wanna invite you to take a moment to populate that in the chat box. And let's just get a sense of how we're feeling and uh, what's alive for each of us in this moment. So I'll give you some time to do that now.
All right, so let's have a look at some of the responses coming through. Um, irritated, yeah, feeling overwhelmed. It goes back and forth, sometimes stressed, sometimes sad, yeah. I'm feeling okay, finishing off classes and trying to adjust to this new normal. Lots of feelings, afraid of the future, economically, emotionally, huge sense of sadness, worried about everyone, generally anxious. Absolutely. I think I can relate to each one of these individual responses to say that even me, I think I've experienced a lot of these myself. And these, again, are very normal, very appropriate responses to the sort of moment that we're living in. And we're going to come back to that a bit later in the presentation. But it is good for us to get a sense of where we're meeting right now and what we're bringing in our heart space to this conversation, what feelings we're carrying at this moment. Yes, yeah, stressed. I used to be busy all the time. Yeah, so it's stressful to have an open schedule. Try to tame the internal darkness. Great. All right. So thank you for sharing those. And I'm going to leave the chat box open on my screen so I can try and track whatever you're saying. Michael's going to help me out if there are any questions that I'm missing that we need to come back to. So I do want to be, um, move on by um, saying a word or two about uh, what is anxiety? Because this is a really big word, particularly in our modern, in our modern day. And uh, it has a lot of um, connotations, a lot of meanings and a lot of weight to it. I will begin here by saying that anxiety is a term um, that can be very easily pathologized, which means that it can be made into a clinical disorder or can be seen as dysfunction in the human experience and the human body. And I do want to gently challenge that assumption that it is a sign of dysfunction. I don't believe that it always is. But if we begin with a, a kind of clinical definition of anxiety, this is taken from the DSM-5, and we'll understand that anxiety is in part about excessive worry that we might experience for the better part of six months that is accompanied by a variety of symptoms. And here are just a few, uh, restlessness, fatigue, concentration issues, irritability, muscle disturbances and muscle tension, uh, sleep disturbances and muscle tension. So, um, you know, that's part of the clinical definition of anxiety, but I'm sure you can already begin to see that we might have some of those symptoms without anxiety in and of itself. Um, and it's important here to mention that there are many types of anxiety. Um, you know, there's social anxiety, panic disorders, death anxiety, um, obsessive compulsive disorders fall under anxieties, um, social phobias would also be classified as an anxiety. So there's many types of, of anxieties out there. And the World Health Organization tells us that one in 13 people suffers from anxiety. And I know that various organizations in various countries around the world have their own research, their own data, um, and of course, that data and research will vary according to which population group we're, we're examining. Another way of thinking about anxiety is that it's actually a very normal um, bodily response that emanates from the anticipation of a future orientated threat. And that piece about the future orientated threat is absolutely critical because anxiety only lives in the future. We, we cannot be anxious in the present moment. Um, and, if, and I'm happy to debate that with anyone who may disagree, but it, is only, it only exists in the future. And because we have this ability as human beings, I think we're the only species that we can actually think ahead of time. We have that cognitive capacity to think ahead of time. We can, we can therefore anticipate danger or catastrophe or misfortune. And when we do that, the body can respond in one of three ways whether that's psychologically through intrusive thoughts, whether that's physiologically through um, increased heart rates, or sometimes we get clammy hands, um, or we might shake, um, or if it's something behavioral, where, for example, we might, um, you know, check a hundred times that we've turned off all the plugs in the house before we leave the front door, or we might wash our hands excessively because we might have a fear of, catching a germ which might lead to an illness. Um, so there's a, very, there's a whole variety of different ways in which anxiety can express itself. But this is an absolutely normal response. And that's why I really challenge the notion that anxiety is always clinical. Obviously it can reach a clinical phase 
and anxiety does live, it does exist on a, on a continuum. And what we really want to think about is what is that sweet spot? How can we use anxiety for our own benefit? Um, because in, when anxiety is in a healthy range, um, we can actually use it to our, to our, for, for good reason and for good purpose because anxiety can actually mobilize us towards action and towards um, doing things that are good for us and good for the, for, for the common good, actually. So anxiety, not altogether a bad thing. Um, it's, it's normal, it's functional. It's only when it really overrides our capacity to function day to day that we want to think about other sorts of interventions to manage the anxiety. And again, feel free to jump in with any questions as we go through the material. And it is important to say here that um, when we're talking about clinical anxiety or an anxiety disorder, it's really um, rare that it will be just a kind of one-off experience that will create that clinical anxiety. There's a whole variety of other contributing life factors. And here are just a few uh, which you can see on the screen right now. We're not gonna go into them exactly for this moment. Um, but what I do want us to think about is the brain because um, it all really begins and starts in the brain. And um, I hope I won't bore you to death, but here's just a, a little bit of brain science 101. Um, just to say that the brain's purpose first and foremost always is to keep us safe. That is the brain's primary function, to keep us safe um, from dangers and from threats. And um, in order to do that, in order for, to fulfill on that function of keeping us safe, um, the brain needs to have certainty. It needs to know what's what and what's going on. Um, and so at every single moment of every single day, the brain is receiving all these different pieces of information, data um, from the environment around us. And it's then classifying all of that information and assessing it and interrogating it and examining it to understand what's what, to understand what's safe and what's not. And when it has made those determinations in the brain, <clears throat> it will then inform other parts of the body how to respond to that given moment. And so when the brain knows what's going on and what's what, we operate from what we call the front part of the brain or the prefrontal cortex. And that's the part of our brain that's really just above our eyes. If we're thinking about how that fits into our head, we're talking about the region just above our eyes up here. It's what we call the prefrontal cortex. And this is the home of all of our um, kind of executive functioning skills. Uh, consequential thinking, logic, reason, some parts of memory, um, all those really, you know, top end, top gear sorts of functions that we need to function and get through our day. And so that's, you know, good for us. It's really helpful for us. But the thing is that when the brain encounters something that is unfamiliar or potentially risky or that poses a threat or that is uncertain, the thing is that a different part of the brain gets activated. And that's what we call the limbic system. And it's actually in the middle part of the brain. And that's where things start to get very, very interesting here because in that part of the brain, there's a little region called the amygdala, and some say it's about the size of an of a, um, almond um, or a peanut. Um, it's this little, little, little part of the brain in the amygdala, in the middle brain, and it acts as an alarm system. So the moment the brain receives some information, some data that something is potentially threatening or frightening or uncertain, this alarm system immediately goes off in the middle brain. Kind of think of it as an alarm system that you would have in your room or at home or in your office here, yeah? just an alarm system. And it alerts the brain, it alerts the body that something is going on here. And in that moment, um, the brain starts to produce stress hormones and it mobilizes the rest of the body to fight that threat or to deal with that threat. Um, and this is all happening from the middle brain. None of this has to do with the front brain. We're not even thinking logically here or necessarily or rationally. We're just responding or reacting in a very um, emotional kind of way. And I do want to say again that this is completely normal. This is, this is part of our evolutionary process that we have this part of our brain 
And the way we respond to a threat in 2020, whether that's coronavirus or a snake or um, the risk of a fire, is the same way that we would have responded in our brain when there was a, <clears throat> a lion or a cheetah charging at us when we were you know, cave people back in the day. It's the same part of the brain responding and working in the same way. And so when there is an overcharge, when there is a lot of energy happening here in this middle part of the brain, when there's a lot of data of uncertainty, unfamiliarity entering the brain, um, what can happen is that it can actually flood over into the front brain. All of that energy, all of that, if you kind of think of it as water coming into a, a water chamber, there's such a rush of energy, such a rush of water that it spills over. It, what they, it's what Daniel Corman calls the amygdala hijack, that it literally hijacks the front brain, meaning that our executive skills literally go offline. And not only are we not using them, but we can't even access those parts of our brain because there's so much energy happening here, so much attention here, that this is just inaccessible to us in that moment. And so I want to suggest that part of what we're experiencing at different times, at different days, not necessarily always um, at this time of COVID-19, is that for many people, there's a lot of energy happening here in our brain, yeah? And that it's causing us to operate, to show up in our lives from a place of reactivity, from a place of stress, from a place of uncertainty. And that we don't always have the luxury or the benefit of accessing our front brain because there's so much threat and uncertainty around us. So I'm just gonna march on here and again, feel free to jump in with questions. If I'm going too fast, let me know. I'm happy to, uh, to slow it down. So while that's all happening in our brain up here, the other quite amazing thing about the human body is that there is a, uh, there's a, nerve, there's a nerve system that's running all the way from our brain, all the way down our body, right into our gut, yeah? Um, it's got many names, it can be referred to by many names, but here we're gonna call it the autonomic nervous system. You really don't need to remember all, any of these technical terms, but that's what we call it, it's just here for the sake of learning. And if you, if you follow this line all the way down from the brain to the gut, if you were to open up the body, you would see that a whole bunch of organs are um, connected to this to this part of the to this nerve system in the body. Yeah, a lot of our key organs that run all the way down our chest feed off and are linked to this part of the body. What I also want to invite you to think about is to think of this um, nerve system as a highway that has at least two ways of traffic. Yeah, and these are represented by these two arrows. I'm colorblind, so I can't tell you what colors they are, but I think one of them's red and maybe the other one is blue, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, if what we know about the system is that when we inhale, right, when we breathe in, we activate this nervous system. And when we exhale, we, we decompress that nervous system. We let it relax, we let it um, take a moment to pause, yeah. That is quite an amazing find that we have discovered through the neuroscience, that this entire nervous system can be regulated throughout breath, that the inhale activates and that the exhale decompresses and relaxes. But the thing is that when the brain here is in a whole variety of stress and anxiety and uncertainty, one of the very first things that happens below our neck is that we engage in this shallow, rapid, very quick, anxious breathing. And some of you may have experienced that before, where suddenly you notice that you're just breathing really quickly for no you know, known reason or no obvious reason. And that what, what we know about that is that we are in an anxious response, that the body is in a state of anxiety. And it doesn't really have the luxury of time to take these deep intentional breaths all the way to the bottom of the diaphragm. And yet, one of the very things that we can do, one of the most important things we can do to manage anxiety is to, to allow ourselves to take these deeper, more intentional breaths, to really come down into the diaphragm, to do long exhales, and to give ourselves the benefit of a nourishing, deep inhale and exhale. 
And we're gonna come back to this a bit later, but I want to present it now just to show its correlation between what's happening in the body and what's happening in the brain and how we actually have this very free, very affordable, very accessible resource, which we call our breath, to manage the stress, to manage the anxiety that's happening up here in the brain. How is this landing so far for people? Yeah, okay, there's a few thumbs. All right, let's move on. So when we are experiencing all these things up in the brain, down in the body, it's, it's very normal, it's very common, and I would even say it's quite appropriate that at times we would feel a whole variety of feelings. And here are just a few. And a lot of the, you know, it's interesting to see that a lot of what you shared in the chat box earlier actually um, echoes some of the, some of the feeling states, some of the emotions that are listed here up on the screen. But I'm listing these here just to really normalize and validate that these are very human feelings and very human experiences that we can feel at a time of stress, anxiety, fear, etc. And obviously there's so many more. So here we're going to break out into breakout rooms in a moment, but I do want to make the obvious point that um, this sort of stress, this sort of anxiety, living in constant fear has real impacts and it impacts so many parts of our lives. Here's just a splattering of a few domains of our lives that can be affected, ranging from everything to do with the self, me as an individual, all the way through to our community and how it's impacting the various pockets of um, people in our community, relationships, work, education, everything can really be impacted. So in a moment, Chai is gonna break us into breakout rooms we are gonna have seven minutes in groups of four or five. And I want to invite you to think about these three questions. In which domain or domains do you notice the impacts of the current in crisis for you? And in what ways are you being impacted and how is this making you feel? So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Chai to kindly um, put us into the breakout rooms and then I'll see each of you back here on the other side of that. Thanks, Chai. We can just take a minute. We're being recorded. Um, maybe we can just take a minute or two here to uh, check in. What, without revealing details of conversations and who said what, what did you hear in those conversations? What emerged in your breakout discussions? And here you can feel free to unmute yourself if there's something you want to share. That uh, COVID nineteen made our uh, walk and school schedules a lot more unique, somewhat more frustrating to keep up with the hours slash motivate ourselves to participate at a much higher level of because when you're at work, you have your boss looking right at you. But when you're at home, you need a lot more self-motivation to survive it. Mm. Yeah, and those are some of the important adaptations that we've all been required to make to get through this uh, to get through this moment. How do we motivate ourselves? How do we encourage ourselves when there's no one there to, you know, to share that with us? I just want to come back as well to a question Yaniv posted in the chat box earlier. He asked, what anxiety are we talking about today? Are we talking about GAD, which is generalized anxiety disorder? And in, I, just, I just want to say there to that question that in a sense, you could say we're talking about GAD, but from a non-clinical perspective, I'm not suggesting that if you're feeling anxious in this moment that you have generalized anxiety disorder, but I do want to suggest that we all are experiencing a generalized sense of anxiety because of COVID-19. So that might be an interesting term, generalized anxiety, but 
maybe we can approach it here from the non-clinical um, perspective because that's not dysfunctional, it's not a disorder. It's just a result of our experience right now. So I'm gonna go back to the slides and uh, let's continue sharing what's here. Okay. Um, so, great, Brenda, you've given us a whole bunch of theory and science. What about, what the hell do we do with it? So I wanna talk about um, some um, tools and techniques that we can use and practices that we can engage in to manage some of what we're feeling at this moment. And I'm gonna begin here by talking about two, la two layers of tools that we can use. And this is not my work, um, it's not my idea. It, um, I've added some thoughts to it, but this is actually the work of Dr. Andrew Huberman, who is a neuroscientist in California, whose work I've been following for a few years. Um, and the first thing he talks about is acute stress. And he says that there are things that we can do in the immediate moment when we're feeling that acute sense of stress or anxiety. There are things that we can do in that moment to help us calm and to help us regulate the body. And, and that's essentially to allow that brain to, or that brain energy to relax and for the breathing system to relax. And so it won't be any surprise that the very first thing he talks about is breath work, yeah? And because if we go back to those earlier slides, that, that um, relationship between the inhale and the exhale is something that we can do to really relax all those organs, to calm down the body and to allow the brain to pause and to switch back on the front part of the brain. And so there's a whole variety of different techniques that we can use for breath work. I've just listed three here. Um, and so the most simple one is to do a longer exhale. So the example here is that if you inhale for two counts, you might exhale for three or four or five, but that might get a bit harder, right? Or if you inhale for three counts, you might exhale for four. You just always wanna make sure that your exhale is longer than your inhale. Um, the other technique is called the double exhale, which is you know, true to its name. If you inhale for two counts, you're going to exhale for four. If you're going to inhale for three counts, you're going to exhale for six. So you're always making sure that your exhale is um, double your inhale. And um, the other one is what we call box breathing. And again, with box breathing, it's up to you which numbers you want to use. But the idea here is that you almost draw a box in your mind as you're doing the practice. So you might inhale for four counts, hold it for four counts, exhale for four counts, and then hold again for four counts, and then you repeat it. But throughout that process, you're kind of making this box, yeah? Inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. And it's that practice, it's that process can really regulate the body and um, through the breath work. So as, um, as an immediate, free, very accessible tool, don't forget you have your breathing and it's a hugely enormous um, resource. The other thing, this is the part that I've added here, is really just the, um, the process of slowing down. Um, and even if that's in um, the pace at which we're talking, yeah, our speech, if we lower the volume of our voice, if we are able to slow down the rate or the pace at which we're moving, you know, maybe we're running down the street, but we actually can just walk for a moment and enjoy the sunshine or look at the trees, you know, or even if we're, and I find myself doing this a lot, like I'm typing emails or typing a, an SMS on my phone, texting, and I think, oh my God, just breathe, just take a breath and slow down, you know? So I think there's a lot of tasks that we do in our day to day where there's an opportunity there just to slow down, just to bring it back a, a beat or one pace. And that can have a similar effect of slowing down our body. And these again are just resources and tools that we can use in the moment to, um, to access just some immediate mitigation of that stress or anxiety in the system. The other piece here is what Andrew Huberman talks about baseline stress. And baseline stress is really just our general level of stress or our general level of anxiety that we have in our lives. And again, as with everything, that's gonna be different for different people at different times of the day, but it's different to the acute stress. The acute stress is just that very heightened 
you know, moment of panic, whereas the baseline stress is more the generalized um, sense of anxiety. So uh, what Andrew Huberman talks about here, obviously, is breath work again. So that can be used for the same purpose to lower, to mitigate our generalized sense of, um, of stress or anxiety. The other thing here is about sleep. And I know that sleep is a, quite a contentious um, discussion sometimes. And I'm not suggesting that people necessarily need to take sleeping medication, you know, pharmacological interventions to sleep. But sleep is actually really critical for the reduction of our baseline stress levels. So it is, I want to invite you here to think about what are your sleep patterns like at this moment? And are there things you can do to improve that quality of sleep if it's something that needs to be improved? And they, you know, if, to do that, there's a variety of interventions from exercise, from um, there's some natural interventions like melatonin. And some people do need pharmacological interventions. It's something for you to discuss with your GP or your physician or whoever it is, your medical professional. But it is something to think about. And I remember when I was at university back in the dark ages, you know, it was almost a competition some days, like how little could you sleep and how cool were you if you could still get through the day on, you know, four hours of sleep. But uh, I want to suggest that it's not actually cool these days to sleep just a few hours, that our body actually needs sleep. We need a lot of sleep. Um, and uh, that can be really good for our, the mitigation of stress and anxiety. The other thing he talks about here are kind of deep relaxation practices. And this is typically where we would talk about things like mindfulness and meditation. And these are different, but different practices, but obviously they're very interconnected at the same time. But what I want to say is that the, the real benefit of these deep relaxation practices is that they bring us into the here and now. And if you remember, I was talking earlier when we started that anxiety only lives in the future. So the thing is that when we come back into the here and now, into this very present moment, we actually can't be anxious. We can only just be. And that's a really critical state of being. And that's a critical um, place for good mental health and well-being. But it's not often that we let ourselves come into the here and now. And that's really what the, the power cell of those practices is that it does. It brings us into, the, into this very moment here and now takes us out of the future thinking the future worrying of what might happen what is the anticipated fear it cuts it out and so here i've listed just some apps um calm headspace and 10 percent that if you want to try out some of these practices these may be um, you know some addresses some apps for you to check out and um, the first two are free but from what i understand 10 percent um, there is a, a bit of a fee to access that service um, through the app. And the, the fourth piece here is self-care practices, which we're going to come back to in a moment or two. Um, but the other thing I want to talk about here is what are some very other specific things we can do to manage COVID-19 anxiety and fear? And so the first thing I want to say here is that you know, we have a duty to ourselves and to the communities in which we live, obviously to adhere physical distancing practices and hygiene practices. And not only is that good for public health and the public good, but it is actually a way of mitigating the fear and the anxiety for ourselves of contracting the virus. And, you know, I, I'm reluctant to say that we can avoid it altogether. I don't want to be overly ambitious here, but we can absolutely mitigate the, the, the chance of transmission if we adhere to some of these practices. And so <clears throat> beyond just the public good, <coughs> the public health benefit, <clears throat> I want to suggest that there's actually a personal benefit there too, to managing our own anxiety and fear. <clears throat> Bear with me. All right, the next piece I want to say here is to practice acceptance. And, you know, that sounds a bit, you know, lovey-dovey. But what I mean there is Sometimes we just need to accept the fact <clears throat> that we're feeling anxious or that we're feeling scared or that we're feeling sad or that we're feeling excited or that we're feeling a whole variety of different feelings and to not judge those feelings, to not judge the emotions that may be coming up for us. And I think that if we're able to practice the acceptance around what it is that we're feeling, it can actually help to mitigate the power of those emotions and feelings. You know, they say if you can name it, you can tame it. 
And there's something around that in, a, in the practice of acceptance too, because sometimes we judge ourselves or we catastrophize that we're feeling anxious or unmotivated or just having a crappy day. But actually it's part of, it's kind of, part of, it's part of the course for what we're experiencing globally in this moment. I also want to suggest here that regulating our exposure to media can be really helpful at this time. And whether that's, um, you know, um, major TV channels or whether it's uh, media newspapers or online newspapers, or if it's in even social media, but um, being exposed to a lot of crisis and a lot of drama and a lot of loss, it's not really good for us all the time. So we do want, you know, we want to be in the know, we want to know what's happening, but we also want to think about how can we regulate that? You know, do we want to just watch the news once a day instead of three times a day? And I'm telling you this as someone who can watch, I love the news. I can watch the news 24 seven, but I know that it's not good for me either at this time, right? And so not only do we want to regulate how much we are exposed to media, but we also want to think about how are we digesting uh, what we're being exposed to, you know? So who's that article coming from? Or who's the person saying X, Y, and Z? Um, you know, is that statistic from the World Health Organization or is it from my local butcher, you know? It, sources come from different places and we have a responsibility to interrogate where they're coming from before we attach meaning to them. Um, another important piece here is for us, obviously, to maintain <clears throat> as much social connection as possible. I think Hillel at Home is a great example of that. And we're seeing huge you know, innovations and a lot of creativity happening in the world right now to maintain social connection. I've seen and heard of wonderful things happening in old age homes, um, you know, synagogues that have gone online, a whole variety of things that are allowing us to maintain social connection because whilst we're in physical distancing, we're not actually in social distancing. We still have a lot of ability to connect socially um, and we don't want to turn that stream of sustenance and nourishment off. Um, and I guess connected to that is really that this idea that this is a moment for a lot of creativity and innovation when it comes to engagement, connection, and conversation. And we have a role to play in that, and we can all play a role in not only how we engage, but how we create opportunities for ourselves and our communities to be in conversation and connection at this time. You know, everything that we know about the human condition is that we are wired for connection. We are wired to interact with other people we're not designed to exist in isolation. So um, the need for social connection now is really, really critical. And it is something that can really help us to reduce the anxiety and the fear that we often feel. Another really important thing here is around routine. And, um, you know, it's been expressed multiple times, but many of our routines have been turned on their head and are out of whack at the moment. And so it's really important to think about how can we create a new routine, a new order, a new normal for ourselves. And that might be as simple as, you know, committing to a bedtime or wake up time or committing to having lunch at a certain time of the day or having blocks in our day for study, for work, for assignments, for relaxation, for meals, whatever it is, and trying to really stick to a routine. And I know that some days we're going to be more disciplined than others that's fine, you know, we can practice the acceptance around that, but where possible, how can we create routine for the purpose of normalcy or normality at this time? And number seven here is about staying focused on what we can control and what we can't. So obviously there's a heap of things that we can't control right now. We can't control, you know, altogether the transmission of this virus. We can't control what's gonna happen in necessarily in a hospital room for a particular patient. We can't control a whole variety of things, and we know that, right? But there are absolutely a whole bunch of other things that we can control, and this may relate back to routine, right? We can control what we're eating. We can control what we are exposing ourselves to in, in the media. We can control what sorts of conversations we're having. We can control how much time we're spending on Zoom every day. And so I want to invite you here to be intentional and to be mindful of where you're focusing your attention and um, what you can control. Because the more we can control, the more empowered we will feel. And, the, and that gives us certainty, that gives us order in our lives, and that can actually reverse 
some of the uncertainty that we're feeling more systemically. <clears throat> Number eight is about being kind to ourselves. And again, you know, this gets a rap sometimes because it can sound very um, airy fairy and lovey dovey. Um, but I do mean this from a place of sincerity that some days <clears throat> are just going to be better than others. And some moments are going to be easier than others. And we don't really know what's around the corner. And we need to be generous to ourselves because we can't have the expectation that we're going to be happy all the time or motivated all the time. And um, that's an unfair expectation for ourselves. And it's also an unfair expectation on others. But at least from the vantage point of self, I want to invite you to think about how can you be kind to yourself? You know, if you're, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling scared, if you're feeling fearful, whatever it is, so that's okay right now, yeah? And who can you reach out to? Is there someone you can call? Is there someone you can have a FaceTime chat with or a Zoom conversation with just to connect and to be in community with other people? Um, number nine here is about maintaining perspective. And here we talk really about a gratitude practice. And I know, you know in my own home, we've started, like a, we've created a gratitude jar where as many times in a day, if, that we want to, we'll write down things that we're grateful for and we put them in the jar. And at the end of a few weeks or when the jar is full, we read them out. But there are so many things for which we can be grateful right now, you know, and we might be grateful for the fact that we have good health or that we have shelter, or that we have food, or that we have a community through Hillel, um, or whatever it is. These, you know, um, focusing on what we're grateful for can help us to maintain perspective around the uncertainty and the fear that we often feel at this time as well. And lastly, I'll say here that obviously speaking with a professional can also be very helpful, whether that's in person, because I know essential services, at least in Australia, you can still see a professional in person, or whether it's online or over the phone. And when I talk about a professional, you know, on one hand, yes, I'm talking about whether a therapist or psychologist or a counselor, but a professional may also be a mentor or it may be a spiritual guide, or it may be a family member. Someone, I want you to really think quite broadly and liberally about what a professional means in this context. Um, and what I mean by it is, you know, someone with whom you can have a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation, where you can open yourself up and be vulnerable and give voice to all that you're experiencing and feeling and fearing and hoping, all of it, right? Because very often, or at least sometimes in our social circles, we feel an expectation or a need to, um, to hide some of those truths about ourselves. And speaking with a professional can really help us to, to um, put down that mask and to be authentic and to be, um, to be honest with ourselves and with someone else. So moving on here, um, this is just a piece that I've added um, for the purpose of this conversation. I know it wasn't in the original title, but it's feeling increasingly important in this moment to talk about loss and to talk about grief, because we are mourning a whole bunch of things at this moment. And um, this is a part of, the, of this moment that we're not really talking about as much as we're talking about the anxiety and the fear. And I want to suggest that, you know, we're mourning a whole bunch of losses, ranging from our social freedoms to family traditions and rituals. And, you know, Pesach is in recent memory that we haven't been able to celebrate Pesach with our families in the way that we might have in the past. We celebrate, we are not celebrating at all. We are mourning um, our routines, you know, how we, the regular ways in which we lived our lives. We're mourning the, the loss of the ability to travel, whether that's domestically or internationally, or even around the parts of the cities that we live in. You know, we might be mourning relationships, people that we can't see anymore because we're in isolation or lockdown. We're mourning income from work or education practices or education possibilities. We're mourning hopes and dreams and aspirations that we all had for ourselves in 2020. And of course, we're mourning lives that have been lost. Yeah, there are so many very important losses, which I feel very sensitive towards, that we're mourning in this moment. And not only are we mourning in the moment, we're also mourning what they call anticipatory losses. We're already mourning things that may never be, losses that we anticipate will happen, you know, in the future. And that adds to the complexity of the grief that we're feeling right now. 
And I want to suggest here, or well, it's not, you know, it's not my thought alone, this is global knowledge, that the experience of grief is not linear. You know, we're not sad and then happy and then we're over the sadness and we're over the grief. It doesn't work like that at all. We go through these um, complete storms of various emotions and feelings around grief and loss. And it's not linear. You know, we may be happy today and terribly upset tomorrow. And we may be peaceful now and completely devastated in an hour from now. And it's really those rhythms of grief and loss that is very normal. And I felt it might be important just to name that here because again, sometimes we have an expectation that we should be over the loss, we should be over the grief, or that it's not relevant, or it's not um, appropriate to grieve, you know, the fact that I can't go to Europe this year when someone has died in a hospital. And what I want to suggest there is that, you know, my grief doesn't take away from your grief, and your grief doesn't take away from your neighbor's grief. We're all entitled to access to our own grief in the way that it exists. Um, and it is not a linear experience. And so one of the things we need to do when it comes to grief is that we want to acknowledge it, we want to name it, and we want to feel it, yeah? Feelings need to be felt. And the more we can feel our feelings, the more power they will lose over us, and the more sense of agency, the more sense of empowerment we will feel for our own emotional terrain. I'm just gonna move on here back to the self-care practices. Um, I'm not going to say too much here because I want to open up for questions in a moment, but I do want, you know, this is, I was on a, I was on a call a few weeks ago now with some Schusterman fellows and people were sharing self-care practices that they're engaging and I, I wrote them down because I thought it was such a colourful list of ideas and this is that list of ideas that people shared. Um, so I'm just putting them up here um, to maybe jog some ideas or to provoke some thought maybe there's something here that you do or that resonates with you or maybe there's something here that you want to give a go it's not really important what other people are doing it's more important to think about what works for you and what's good for you and again just to locate this in saying that self-care practices speak to that baseline stress level yeah it's how do we over time and through these practices manage the general sense of stress or anxiety that we might be feeling in our lives and we know that things like movement, creativity, being focused on, a, on an activity can really help to, uh, it can be really helpful for our mental health and for our well-being. So an invitation to you here is to think about what works for you and, uh, and or what might you want to uh, practice or give a go in the next few days or weeks. Um, another little tool that I want to share with you and Again, you don't have to worry about all of this now because I'm happy to share the slide deck. This is a, it's a model from um, Anxiety UK. And, you know, we could use this practice for anxious thoughts. You could also use it for, for feelings if we want to use it as a model to process a feeling that we might be experiencing. But it's a, I think they, I can't remember what they call it, but, you know, the idea is that it's apple and each letter refers to a different step of the process. But it begins with the acknowledgement and the noticing, you know, what's in our mind, what's in our body. And then it moves into really pausing and taking that deep intentional breath, not reacting, just being very present to what is alive for us. And then pulling back and reminding ourselves that this thought or the feeling is uh, it's not helpful, it's not permanent, you know, and that just like every other thing, it will pass as well. And to help to help it pass we can give ourselves permission to let go of the thought yeah we might imagine it floating away uh, like a bubble or a cloud in the sky just visualize that thought or that feeling floating away from us and then we want to come back to the present moment with the spirit of exploration spirit of curiosity just to be in the here and now yeah and to know that in the here and now in this very moment i'm safe yeah notice my breath Notice the sensations in my body. You might want to feel the ground beneath your feet. Yeah. We might want to look around us. What can we see? What can we hear? What can we touch? What can we smell? And these and use our senses really as a way to ground us back in the moment. Yeah. And when we're able to come back into the moment, we're then able to very mindfully proceed 
with whatever it is that we were doing before or mindfully proceed into the rest of our day or the rest of the evening or whatever it is. So um, this is a, a very helpful practice. It's one that I use a lot myself and uh, I want to offer it to you here as another tool, as a resource to allow you to, uh, to come into the here and now, yeah, and to manage some of the feelings or the anxiety in your body so that you can move on mindfully and peacefully throughout your day. So um, here I'm going to stop talking for a little bit and I run and open it up so you can unmute yourselves. And I would love to hear, you know, how this is landing, what's resonating with you, if you have any questions, what are you taking or making of this conversation. So let's open it up for some discussion. We have quite a few minutes left before we wrap up because we have till quarter past the hour. So um, yeah, let's, let's hear where you at. What are you making of this? Thank you, Brando, for going through all this. I really resonated with your, um, the map of the human body with the red and blue arrows up and down mm -hmm. and about how um, powerful the exhales are, how simple it is to do. And sometimes it comes naturally and sometimes it's like practice that's like, you need a reminder to do it. And it, it is really powerful to notice your breath and, and slow it down. You can, you know, I know from, I was doing it while you were talking about it, but then also, um, you know, you can feel it calming your body, which is it's really nice. Yes. And I want to even um, suggest a visual to accompany that, right? Which is, as I was saying before, there's all these key organs that are connected to that nervous system. And so a visual that we might want to engage in is to imagine, to visualize, all those organs just relaxing with you as you exhale. And I find that that visualization can even um, add to that sense of relaxation, that sense of pause, yeah? Thanks, Phil. We have Phil. a question from Yaniv Friedman. Yaniv, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, I keep trying to know my hand and keep raising it back up. Uh, um, something I liked about what you did here is that you hit the different versions of anxiety without going too, too deep into the scientific part. Uh, you make it easier for a layman's man and not scientific person to understand uh, what's going on. So I wanted to say thank you for that ad. There was actually a few things that you talked about that I didn't realize was even a symptom of anxiety. I thought it was a symptom of a few other things and I didn't realize that anxiety was so unique and it, it has various symptoms that may relate to other things like depression or stressors. I found that to be very unique, your list. Oh, and your self-care thing, and I didn't realize how the breathing works. Uh, I always thought it was two seconds in through the nose, two seconds out from the mouth, which is how I thought what I learned in running. I didn't realize therapeutic breathing and uh, um, running breathing were two different things. So I learned something new today. Thanks, Yaniv. And if I can just um, speak to some of the things you've said there. Um, one of the troubles with anxiety is that, it, as I said at the very beginning, that it's easily made into a clinical disorder. It's often viewed very scientifically as a disorder or dysfunction in the human condition. And so I'm, I, I'm glad that you have understood my intention here, which is to really normalize anxiety as a very human normal evolutionary function, yeah? If we didn't have anxiety, that alarm system in our brain would never go off. And we need that alarm system to go off, right? Because it keeps us safe. And that is, that is part of the anxiety. So 
on, on one level, on one hand, we absolutely, you know, want to welcome anxiety, but we also want to be able to keep it in that healthy range. Yeah. It's when it, it's when it overrides, as I said earlier, the ability to, for us to function daily, to get out of bed, to do our uni work or whatever it is, that's where we're running into troubles, right? And that's where we want to think about, is it getting disordered or dysfunctional? But in that healthy range, it is absolutely functional. And um, yeah, as you said, some of the symptoms that we you know, experience with anxiety are symptoms that we express with a variety of other experiences too, like depression or sadness or stress or whatever it is. And this is what makes diagnosis actually so challenging that um, so many of the symptoms run across so many different sorts of diagnoses. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Out of curiosity, do you think the DM5 fixed some of the subclasses of anxiety a, with comparing to how it was in like the DM, uh, DSM? three and four are when they talked about anxiety. So I know they reclassified anxiety a few times. What is your opinion on that? We could have a whole webinar on the DSM. It's a very political book <laughs> um, because it's, it is financed by the pharmaceutical companies and many of the, uh, many of the people from what I understand on the board of DSM are actually from the pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I think that there have been, you know, obviously adjustments and whether they improvements or not, I, I won't be the judge of that in DSM-5. But, um, you know, I use it as a guide. I don't use it as, as, the, as the Bible, as the word of God. Um, but there are also other resources. I know that the World Health Organization has its own version of a DSM, um, which is a bit more inclusive and a bit more um, extensive as well in its understanding of of these human conditions. All right, so if there's no other comments, is there anything in the chat box that we need to check? There's what was no the name of the other DSM you were saying from the World Health Organization? There is the World Health, Health Organization, yeah. Yeah. All right, anything here we need to... Okay. Does anyone, all right, any just other comments before we move on? Okay. I wanted to just end with this poem. I think it's a poem. It might also be a prayer. I never, I'm never, I read it a hundred times, but I'm never really sure which one it is. But um, I'm wondering if someone on our call wants to uh, volunteer to read this, read this poem for us. Oh, whoops. Now I've lost it. Let me go back and find it. Well, while I do that, does someone want to volunteer to read it for us? I'm happy to otherwise. I can do it, Brando. Brando. Oh, did someone else volunteer? I did, Sue. Okay, go for it, Sue, great. No mind. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full sh shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, May we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hope to be, and may we stay that way better for each other because of the worst. Mm. Thank you for reading that for us. And um, I, you know, this, I'm always very, I, as I said, I've read it a hundred times, but I feel very moved every time I read it again because it gives me a sense of hope that you know, there, will be an, there will be an other side to this crisis, yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that when we get there, and I hope that it will be soon, not that I'm a prophet, but I hope that when we get there, that we will all be 
in the best state of mind that we can be. Yeah. And that's, it's in that spirit that I want to share these thoughts, these ideas with you today on how we can manage our anxiety, our fear, and some of our loss and grief. Um, so that we are as robust as we can be when we get to the other side, so that we can show up in the best versions of ourselves and um, who we want to be on that other side. So, you know, just to close, I, uh, these are my sources, if anyone is interested. <laughs> um, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to, to be here with you today and to Phil and to Michael and Hillel for making this possible and to say that the love and the light in me really honours and acknowledges each of you and all the love and the light in you. And I hope that at this time you will be healthy and safe and that you'll stay in connection with your with your loved ones and your communities and that we'll see each other in a better place very soon on the other side of COVID-19. So thank you again. And if there's anything, if there are any questions you want to, you know, further explore or ask me about, feel free to email me or you can WhatsApp me. There's my number and international dialing code, feel free. Um, and I'm also happy to share the slide deck. Um, so thank you again and uh, take good care of yourselves. Until next Thank time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome.